On the edge of western South America, wedged between Earth's driest desert, largest rainforest and second highest mountain range, lay a sprawling empire. The Inca, through ingenious engineering and strict central planning, forged one of the world's most unusual empires. It was the largest empire in the pre-Columbian Americas, without a written language, the wheel or money, and one of the only empires to stretch upwards rather than across. In this video, we will look at how the Inca rose to power from unknown origins and dominated their region. When Columbus arrived in the Americas in 1492, he was unaware that about 2,000 kilometers away lay a bustling empire of 2 million square kilometers. Tahuantinsuyu, the land of the Four Quarters, as the Inca called their realm, included parts of modern Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. It had a population of more than 10 million across innumerable ethnic groups and languages. The Inca developed in near isolation, so their culture was missing many things that were vital in the old world. The wheel was absent, along with any draft animal capable of pulling weight. Steel and iron were unknown, while gold, silver and bronze were masterfully worked. Most intriguing was that they lacked a written language, so their knowledge was passed on orally or through a unique system of knots called kipu. These knots were used to collect data, keep records, measure taxes and record the census. However, as the Spanish established control over the Inca, the ability to read kipu faded away and the records are now indecipherable to us. Therefore, most of the history we have about the Inca has come down to us through Spanish historians or oral traditions. With that in mind, let's take a look at the origins of the Inca Empire. Ancient Peru was one of the ancient cradles of civilization, and between 8000 and 3000 BC, the people there domesticated llamas and alpacas, along with an immense variety of crops such as potatoes, corn, beans, peanuts, squashes and quinoa. From these early agricultural societies, a series of complex cultures emerged, such as Tiwanaku, Wari and Chimu. By 900 AD, States like Tiwanaku were erecting huge stone structures, building highways and canals, and maintaining a capital of 50,000 people at a time when London had around 30,000, all at 3,000 meters above sea level. The Inca were the final great society to emerge here, and inherited much from those that came before. As the Chimu Empire was at its peak, to its south, the tiny kingdom of Cuzco slumbered. This small kingdom would rapidly transform into Tawentinsuyu, or what we call the Inca Empire. Where exactly did the Inca come from? Well, let's take a look at the Inca's own mythological origin story. It begins with the great creator god Viracocha, who came upon three caves. From the central cave, Viracocha brought forth four brothers and four sisters. These were to be the founders of the Inca civilization. Out of the side caves stepped others, who were to be the forebayers of the other, less important Inca clans. One of the brothers, Ayamanco, armed with a golden staff capable of testing soil, led his people on an exodus-like journey, at the end of which he was the only remaining brother. Upon entering the valley of Cuzco, the golden staff sank into the ground, and so his people settled there. The city of Cuzco was founded, and Ayamanco adopted the name Manco Capac. This is one of the many origin myths of the Inca. The myth would be regularly changed and updated for political reasons. For example, if the Inca wanted to integrate a foreign state or power into their empire, then that entity would conveniently find itself wedged into the current mythology. But Manco Capac was probably a real person that led a group of nomads into the valley and founded Cuzco in the early 13th century. The history of the first eight Inca kings is lost in the mists of time. 
its ninth king was the first to step into certain history. An Inca Alexander the Great, called Kusi Yapanqui, rose to power in the early 1400s. At the time of his birth, the kingdom of Cusco was barely more than a chiefdom. He was not the first in line to the throne, but after Cusco was besieged by 40,000 enemy Chanca soldiers and his king father and prince brother fled the city, it was Kusi Yupanqui who organized a defense and not only saved the city, but also won himself the crown. Before his reign, his kingdom held the small territory around Cusco, but within a single lifetime, he and his son had stretched the new empire from present-day Bolivia to Ecuador. He adopted the name Pachacuti, which means Earthshaker or he who turns the world upside down. Through the use of spies, Pachacuti would assess the military strength and wealth of the other states in the region. After collecting this information, he would send messages to the leaders of these states, attempting to persuade them to join his empire. He promised they would keep their position and would grow even more powerful. Luxury goods and riches would be poured upon them, only, however, if they submitted peacefully. If they accepted, the heirs of that ruler would be sent to the royal court in Cusco, whereupon they would be educated in an Inca fashion and raised to be perfect Incas. Once transformed, they were then sent back to rule their realms in a thoroughly Inca style. If they did not accept, they were usually crushed by the huge multi-ethnic army Pachacuti built. Pachacuti reorganized the Kingdom of Cusco into Tahuantinsuyu using a federalist system. He split the empire into four parts, or suyus, each managed by provincial governors that reported directly to the central government in Cusco. Cusco was transformed into a suitable imperial city and center to Pachacuti's new empire. The city was paved with perfectly cut stone, and from its center spread vast highways linking all the Suyus. Along with these highway projects, Pachacuti also initiated the construction of huge royal estates, the most famous of which is Machu Picchu, located 2,430 meters above sea level. The rapid growth of the empire was incredible, and even more impressive was the idea that the Inca actually tried to integrate the conquered peoples into their empire, rather than just setting up mostly independent tributary states like the Aztecs had done. By the time Pachacuti's grandson, Huayna Capac, sat on the throne, there was hardly anything else left to possibly conquer. Militarily, the Inca were extremely organized and used a flexible decimal system to organize units. They could raise armies of hundreds of thousands of soldiers and move them across rough terrain with ease. Almost all able-bodied men between 25 and 50 had military training. Each province would send men to join a military campaign whenever needed. The state made sure that no province was sending more men than they could and on particularly long campaigns, men were regularly allowed to return home to make sure their lives did not fall out of order. Like the Aztecs, the Inca relied on cotton armor. They wore thick alpaca wool tunics and helmets to protect themselves. These tunics were so effective at stopping arrows that Spanish soldiers adopted them while fighting the Inca and there are reports of them leaving battles looking like porcupines with dozens of arrows wedged in their armor. A large shield made of hardwood imported from their jungle provinces was kept on their back. Another, much smaller shield made of lighter wood was kept on the arm. A small cape attached to it could be used to protect their legs from missiles. As the empire was so diverse, they relied on an equally diverse range of weapons and soldiers. Men recruited from the jungle provinces were excellent bowmen, while those from the other provinces preferred dart throwers and slings. For melee combat, the Inca had a varied arsenal. Spears, axes, clubs, star-headed maces and halberds were the most common weapons and could be made from stone, bronze or bone. The Inca were talented with bowlers, which were multiple stones tied together that wrapped around an enemy's legs. These would be used effectively against the Spanish cavalry. 
the Inca used their military to expand their reach across the spine of South America, crushing resistance wherever it showed its head. In less than 100 years, they created the greatest empire in the Americas. But how did they keep it all functioning, and how did they keep 10 million mouths fed in a land of extremes? The Inca built an empire that if placed over the old world would stretch from St. Petersburg to Cairo. They transformed a hostile landscape into an agricultural marvel and developed a culture with such respect for the dead that corpses were engaging in politics decades after life had left them. In this video, we will look at how the Inca adapted to their environment and became what British historian Felipe Fernandez Armesto called the most impressive empire builders of their day. Most of the Inca heartland is 3,000 meters above sea level and has low rainfall, low temperatures and thin soils. It can drop below freezing every single month at this altitude. There is nowhere else on Earth, said anthropologist John Murrah, where millions insist against all apparent logic on living at 10,000 or even 14,000 feet above sea level. Nowhere else have people lived for so many thousands of years in such visibly vulnerable circumstances. The one advantage to this environment, though, was the enormous ecological variety. Due to the massive fluctuations in altitude, you can encounter more than 20 different life zones within a few hundred kilometers. The Inca used this to their advantage. A diverse range of crops was planted in different ecological zones and at different altitudes to ensure against famines caused by climatic changes or diseases, as not all zones would be affected similarly. Any surplus food was stored in warehouses controlled by the state for insurance against famine and drought, and a kind of freeze-dried potato was developed called chinyo to preserve potatoes in these warehouses for longer periods. As llamas cannot pull a plow very well, all plowing and farming was done by hand. Ancient Andean cultures soon realized that a large group could plow a field much faster than a single farmer. This soon developed into a complex system of reciprocity and cooperation, which became a pivotal trait to nearly all Andean cultures. In times of famine, supplies would be redistributed to those in need. Widows, the sick, and people too old for work were taken care of and had their lands worked for them. With such an extreme environment, the Inca had to develop these kinds of safeguards to ensure society ran smoothly. Total cooperation from all members of society was necessary, a trait which led to one of the strangest parts of Inca society, the complete lack of markets. It is hard for us to imagine, but the Inca civilization functioned nearly entirely without money. The production, storage and distribution of goods were wholly controlled by the central Inca government. Each citizen received and contributed food, tools and clothing to and from state-owned warehouses and needed to purchase nothing. Taxes were not collected in money, since there was none, and neither were they collected in other valuables. Instead, taxes were collected in the form of human labor, in a system called mita. Through the use of mita, the central government could move workers across the empire and focus them on what the highest priority tasks were. Mining, sewing and construction are just a few of the tasks that were carried out by mita workers. This is how the Inca were able to complete massive projects in their short 100-year reign. A primary trait of Andean civilizations is their relationship with llamas and alpacas, the only large domesticable animal in the region. Llamas and alpacas were essential to Inca society. They could not only help by carrying goods, but also by providing meat and, most importantly, cloth. This cloth was everything to the Inca. It kept the state functioning. It clothed the people, it functioned as a marker of rank, and well-made cloth was regularly gifted to people that pleased the emperor. Cloth was so tightly regulated that the government even issued people their outfits. 
Each province of the Inca Empire was given some of the state-owned herds and had to produce a certain amount of cloth each year that would be stored in the state-owned warehouses. The Inca warehouses, called Cucas, were built along the Inca highway system, one every 22 kilometers or so. An immense variety of goods were stored there and they could be distributed whenever needed. The storehouses were a response to the challenges of the Andean environment. The lack of navigable rivers, wheeled vehicles or large draft animals meant that goods couldn't be transported long distances easily. So these warehouses were constructed within walkable distances. They also allowed armies to march across the realm without weapons and equipment slowing them down as they could equip themselves at the warehouse closest to their destination. One of the most essential elements in the success of the Inca Empire was the remarkable system of highways, extending for at least 40,000 kilometers. These highways had to pass over mountains, and frightening suspension bridges were common. Relay stations called tambos dotted the highway, stationed by runners or casquis. These were the fastest men from the nearby town who would run from one tambo to another with gifts, quipu or messages. This system allowed the Incas to send information across 392 kilometers in a day. The Roman Empire, even with mounted messengers, could rarely get a message over 320 kilometers away in a day. Along with these huge highway projects, the Inca cut through mountainsides building cisterns, terraces and irrigation canals to increase agricultural productivity. At the empire's peak in the 16th century, over a million hectares of terraces were in use. A terrace was constructed by building a retaining wall and then laying gravel, then sand and then soil on top of each other, forming a step. This captured water that would otherwise rush down the hillside and prevented flooding by filtering the water slowly. It also provided a way to stop crops from freezing as the stones would absorb heat from the sun and retain it through the cold Andean nights. In an environment where only 2% of the land is suitable for agriculture, the Inca transformed their heartland into an agricultural powerhouse. Finally, there's the magnificent Inca stonework. The Inca used perfectly fitted stones that could stick together without the use of mortar. They fit stones together like enormous jigsaw pieces. They were so well fitted, a pin could not pass through most of the joints. Major Inca constructions have also been found to be earthquake proof. These rocks were quarried, shaped and moved using mostly stone tools and rope. That is the physical Inca realm, but what was their spiritual realm made up of? The Inca believed wholeheartedly in the idea that the spirit realm and ours were linked, and that the dead could influence events in our world. One of the most unusual manifestations of this belief was Inca mummification. These Malki, as the Inca called them, were not the typical way to spend your afterlife. Only members of influential families were regularly mummified, and the corpse was treated as if it were living. They were fed, dressed and cared for as if nothing was different. In return, the dead would protect their families, maintain fertile land and ensure a steady supply of water. They were consulted in all critical life matters and asked about how to proceed during troubling times. The mummies of Inca rulers received an unimaginable level of care and respect. They lived an afterlife enviable to the living. Dead Inca rulers were meticulously preserved, so much so that the Spanish discovered people worshipping them long after the empire had fallen. Even in death, Inca nobles still maintained control of all their wealth, land and estates. What is odd to us made perfect sense to the Inca, as mummies were seen as living creatures. This strange belief contributed to both the rise and fall of the Inca. As the wealth of a dead emperor was not passed on to his successor, it was instead managed by their panica, which was a kind of royal family group tasked with preserving mummies. So new emperors could not use the wealth of their predecessor, 
and new conquests and constructions had to commence immediately to secure wealth and power. As all the good land around Cusco fell under the control of dead rulers and their strange mummy corporations, emperors had to spend significant amounts of time and effort on campaigns far away from the empire's center. This expanded the empire quickly, but allowed little time for consolidation. Competing panickers vied for power so intensely and ruthlessly that Machiavelli himself would blush and Medici would take notes. When the Spanish arrived, they would use these competing families against one another to weaken the empire. Despite all their monumental buildings and works, and despite the kind of guaranteed welfare that the Inca stage provided, they were still plagued with revolts. Their empire didn't have a lot of time to consolidate their rule. When the Spanish arrived, the empire was barely 100 years old. Loyalties from conquered ethnic groups were fickle, and emperors had to deal with many bloody revolutions during their reigns. No Inca emperor dealt with more of these than Huayna Capac, who spent most of his reign pacifying newly conquered territory. However, he isn't remembered today as being the revolt-smashing emperor. No, he's remembered as the first Inca emperor to die of smallpox, and his death kicked off a massive Inca civil war just as the Spanish first arrived. 500 years ago, atop the snow-capped Andes, in a still barely mapped continent, thousands of meters above sea level, two new empires smashed into each other in a historical collision that reverberates into the modern day. Conquistador and Sapa Inca, men from different worlds will clash. The Arquebus and Huaraca will meet, and Tawintinsuyu, the land of four parts together, will be undone. In 1528, Hernán Cortés had just returned from Mexico, bringing tales of conquest along with unimaginable treasures. The Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain, Charles V, received him and his riches in Toledo. As Cortés impressed the royal court, another veteran of the New World arrived at the city. It was Francisco Pizarro, the second cousin of Cortés. Pizarro had arranged to meet the king and planned to impress him with gifts. Gold, silver, feathers, natives and bizarre creatures unknown outside of the Andes. Pizarro told his king of the magical land of Peru, home to a native empire that Pizarro assured him could be conquered in his name. On the 26th of July 1529, Pizarro was issued a royal license to conquer this new land and named the governor of Peru. Armed with a royal permission, Pizarro set off recruiting potential conquistadors. He returned to his hometown of Trujillo, gathered his four brothers, Juan, Francisco, Gonzalo and Hernando, and then set sail for the Americas in January 1530. The Sapa Inca, Huayna Capac, had recently subdued much of what is now Ecuador, when reports began trickling in. Strange men had traded with the city of Tumbes. Alongside these reports came others that were much more horrific. Chesky's runners arrived daily, informing the Sapa Inca that a disease had appeared in the north and was killing thousands. Nothing like it had ever been seen before. Plagues were unknown to the Inca, so this strange sickness, known to us as smallpox, ravaged the population. The Eurasian disease was not brought by Pizarro, however, as it arrived slightly before he did, creeping in from North and Central America. In the following years, up to 90% of the empire would succumb to the disease. Sometime around 1527, the Sapa Inca Huayna Capac and his heir died from smallpox alongside millions of their subjects. Two years before Pizarro had petitioned the King of Spain, Eurasian germs had initiated the conquest for him. With the succession now unclear and the realm divided, the sons of Huayna Capac both tried to claim the throne and tossed the empire into chaos. Atahualpa, who possessed much less territory than Huascar, controlled his dead father's veteran legions and slowly pushed down from Quito towards Cusco. During the final bloody climax of the war in 1532, 
Huascar's remaining armies were smashed outside of Cuzco and he was captured by Atahualpa's generals. Atahualpa was camped over 900 kilometers away in the town of Cajamarca with a small portion of his army awaiting news of the battle. Even with the Inca's exceptional highways and their tireless chess keys, it would take five days for word of the victory to reach Atahualpa. There, in Cajamarca, Atahualpa planned his eventual coronation as the supreme ruler of the Inca world. He was eager to get word from his generals and set off on his victory march towards his new capital. But there was just one small detail that he needed to deal with at the moment. Reports were coming in from his chiefs that a small band of 168 foreigners, some of whom were riding giant llamas, was causing havoc on the coast, and it appeared they were now marching straight for Cajamarca. Atahualpa was curious, and rather than have these men killed, he decided to see them and their strange llamas himself. What could 168 do against his 50,000 soldiers? He had agreed to meet the Spaniards in the central plaza of Cajamarca. This was a ceremonial meeting between his vast empire and some lowly visitors. So on Saturday, November 16, 1532, Atahualpa entered the square at Cajamarca, followed by 6,000 of his barely armed men. A battle was not expected. Atahualpa was quite confident, as just the day before he had heard of his victory at Cuzco and the capture of his rival brother Huascar. So this was a day of celebration. Once he had had his meeting with this odd band of foreigners, he could march south and have his glorious coronation. Pizarro and his men had planned to emulate Cortes. They would capture Atahualpa, thus cutting off the head of the Inca Empire and paralyzing it. Atahualpa, as Sapa Inca, was supreme ruler of the empire, and it could not function without him. Pizarro had hidden his men in the buildings surrounding the square, and stationed the artillery and arquebuses on the far side of the square, ready to fire. Like too many fans in a tiny football stadium, the Inca troops crowded into the square, which had only two narrow exits. Not a single Spaniard could be seen. As the sun began to set, nothing could be heard in the square except for a slight breeze. The fear inside the stone buildings was incalculable. Pedro Pizarro said, I heard that many Spaniards urinated on themselves without noticing it from sheer terror. Eventually, two men appeared from the buildings and approached Atahualpa. Vincente de Valverde, a Dominican friar, and an inexperienced native translator. The friar read the following to Atahualpa. I request and require you to recognize the church as your mistress and as governess of the world and universe. And if you do not do this, with the help of God we shall come mightily against you, and we shall make war on you everywhere and in every way that we can, and we shall subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church and his majesty, and we shall seize your women and children, and we shall make them slaves to sell and dispose of as his majesty commands. And we shall do all the evil and damage to you that we are able. And I must insist that the deaths and destruction that result from this will be all your fault. This was the Requerimiento, a document read aloud to the native peoples of the New World, informing them of Spain's divine right to conquer these lands in the name of God. Valverde then approached Atahualpa and offered him a Bible. Atahualpa had heard reports of the men's fascination with these objects, but he had no way to contextualize what this was or how to interact with it. He had had enough with these foreigners now, and their disrespect for the Inca diplomatic customs. Atahualpa scolded Valverde and the Spanish for stealing from warehouses and killing Inca chiefs, and proceeded to toss the book aside. Valverde Horrified at this perceived act of extreme blasphemy, sprinted towards the stone buildings, shouting, Come out! Come out, Christians! Come at these enemy dogs who reject the things of God! The square again fell silent.
With loud roars, the cannons and arquebuses soon fired directly into the mass of warriors, spewing out smoke and metal shrapnel. Inca soldiers, shocked by the sounds, soon saw beasts riding towards them. The Spanish war cry, Santiago, was screamed as men rushed out of the buildings. A massacre ensued as the panic-stricken Inca force tried to retreat out of the tiny square. Dazed masses of soldiers ran for the narrow exits. It was impossible to escape. Thousands died, trampled under their comrades or horses. Chopping through the men holding the royal litter, Pizarro and his men grabbed Atahualpa and dragged him back into one of the stone buildings. Just that morning, he was basking in a victory that took four years to complete. Atahualpa was now, at sunset, prisoner to an unknown group of people. The Inca Empire, which only just finished a destructive civil war, was now involved in the highest stakes hostage situation of all time. The survivors of the massacre ran from the square, and the rest of the Inca army, now leaderless, dispersed into the countryside. Atahualpa noted the excitement the Spaniards had at finding gold trinkets amongst the wreckage. He concluded that these were pirates from some faraway land. If he could give them enough gold, then they would return to their ships and be gone. He told Pizarro that in exchange for his life and freedom, he would fill the room they were in with gold and twice over with silver. Atahualpa delivered on his promise. For months, the greatest treasures and artifacts of the Inca Empire poured into Cajamarca. The room was filled, and everything was melted down into ingots, which is why gold or silver Inca artifacts are so rare today. In the end, the gold totaled 1.3 million pesos de oro, or around 400 million 2018 US dollars, to be divided between the 168 men and the King of Spain. As the ransom poured in, so did more Spanish troops. Diego de Almagro, Pizarro's business partner, arrived with an extra 153 men. The fact that more Spaniards had arrived made it clear that this was an invasion force. These men were here to stay. After the Inca fulfilled their promise, it became obvious to Pizarro and his men that Atahualpa had outlived his usefulness and was now only a liability. If he were rescued, they would not be able to defeat the resistance he would organize. On July 26, 1533, Atahualpa was brought into the main square of Cajamarca and was tied to a wooden stake. The native population gathered around in awe at what was happening. Atahualpa was not only the supreme ruler of the empire, but also their god. Watching this happen must have shaken the entire world view of the local people. Valverde, the same friar that offered him a Bible a month before, came to him and offered a baptism. If Atahualpa rejected this offer, he would be burned alive. No fate could be worse for him. If his body were not perfectly preserved like the previous emperors, then he would not pass on correctly to the afterlife. He accepted and was quickly baptized. Still, he was then strangled to death as a Christian. The conquistadors soon left Cajamarca and began the long trek to Cuzco. As the square and that lonely stake in its center faded into the distance, Pizarro and his men must have felt confident that this wealthy empire was already in their hands. But the conquest of the Inca was far from over. The body of the god king Atahualpa lay partially burned in a hastily dug ditch near Cajamarca. His empire was now in the hands of Francisco Pizarro and his brothers. On their long march towards Cuzco, they encountered the teenage brother of Huascar, Manco Inca, and placed him on the throne. Wielding power through this puppet king, the conquistadors were welcomed into Cuzco as liberators rather than conquerors. The new Inca-Spanish military alliance crushed all forces within the empire that had remained loyal to Atahualpa's faction. With the massive empire now firmly in his grip and a military alliance secured with the Manco Inca, Pizarro and his brothers set about transforming Tahuantinsuyu into New Castile. 
Lands and lordships over the natives were handed out to Pizarro's men. Those few hundred conquistadors, many of them poor and illiterate, soon found themselves rich beyond their wildest expectations. After Manco Inca's coronation in Cusco, both leaders of the Spanish expedition would leave the city. Francisco Pizarro would go to the coast to found the city now known as Lima, and Diego de Almagro, frustrated that Pizarro had been named the sole governor of Peru and furious that Pizarro had refused to share Atahualpa's ransom with him and his men, departed with 570 Spanish cavalry and foot soldiers and with 12,000 native troops. His goal was to conquer the southern part of the Inca Empire in what is now Chile. The Inca capital, Cusco, was now left in the hands of Manco Inca and Pizarro's two younger brothers, Juan and Gonzalo. Manco Inca tried to get to work rebuilding his fractured and smallpox-ridden realm, but with Juan and Gonzalo now in charge of the city, the illusion of an equal alliance between the emperor and the Pizarros quickly shattered. Juan and Gonzalo harassed Manco Inca for gold, silver and native women. They soon began to disrespect him in public, and then Gonzalo Pizarro kidnapped and raped Manco Inca's wife, Cura Oclo. Soon he was imprisoned and beaten. Manco Inca now became aware of the horrific bargain he had made for the title of Sapa Inca. Tensions had reached a boiling point. In early November of 1535, two years after the death of Atahualpa, the puppet King Manco took his first steps towards rebellion. A secret meeting of the Inca nobility was called, and Manco made a speech to his chiefs. I ask you, where did we meet them? What is it that we owe them? Or which one of them did we injure, so that with these horses and weapons of iron, they have made such cruel war on us? It seems to me that it would be neither just nor honest that we put up with this. Rather, we should strive with the utmost determination to either die to the last man, or to kill our cruel enemies. Manco fled the city into the harsh Andes, and soon the Inca war machine began to slowly creak into motion. Chasqui's runners breathlessly crisscrossed the empire, bringing word of Manco's rebellion to the native chiefs. Soon the conquistadors, now the feudal lords, were individually lured away from their palaces and manors and clubbed to death. Within months, these small-scale attacks had killed more Spaniards than had died in the entire conquest thus far. As reports of these deaths trickled into Cusco and Lima, far off in the mountains native soldiers started gathering clubs, axes, spears and halberds from their warehouses and marching across the Andes to answer the call of their emperor. The 20-year-old great-great-grandson of Pachacuti, who had served as a meek puppet for two years, was now at war with the invaders from across the sea. Like a giant blanket covering the hillsides, the immense legions of Manco converged on Cusco. Hernando, Juan and Gonzalo Pizarro were now trapped inside, along with 196 Spaniards, a handful of African slaves and Morisca women, and hundreds of native allies. Early in the morning, on Saturday the 6th of May, 1536, conch shell trumpets rang out from the mountains surrounding Cusco. A curtain of javelins, rocks and arrows darkened the sky, while 100,000 soldiers, wielding massive spears and clubs, began to slowly make their way down the hillside, encircling the glittering city. The constant barrage forced the defenders to immediately run for cover. Inca troops poured into the city and forced the Spaniards to retreat into two buildings located in the main plaza. Manco knew from experience that Inca weapons were ineffective against Spanish armor and cavalry. It was near impossible for an Inca to kill a Spaniard in hand-to-hand -hand combat. No matter the strength behind a blow or the bravery of the warrior, stone and bronze could never pierce steel. The Spanish could only be killed if knocked from their horses or with a direct impact to the face. Manco's strategy was to tighten a noose around the city, trap the Spaniards and then overwhelm them with his superior numbers. In a panic, the Spaniards darted between the two buildings, now transformed into bunkers. 
Hernando Pizarro was screaming orders and doing his best to reinforce his position. But before they could even formulate a real plan, the roof of the buildings caught fire. Inca slingers and archers were firing red-hot rocks and flaming arrows into the city. The trapped Spaniards soon found themselves suffocating from the smoke. Hot ashes filled the air. Broken beams fell from the ceiling, tossing up fresh burning embers. As the heat became more intense, it seemed all hope was lost. Until suddenly, the fire went out. Some Spaniards claimed to have seen the Virgin Mary herself descend from heaven and put out the flames. The Inca chronicles report that it was the African slaves that the Spanish had stationed on the roof who put it out under a barrage of arrows and rocks. The Incas continued to heave against the Spanish defences. Unable to cut through their armour or defend against a cavalry charge, they swarmed the city and laid a noose around the precarious Spanish position. At the end of the day, they had to cease the attack, barricade the streets they had taken, and rest. From his command centre nearby in Calca, Manco Inca no doubt was certain that within days he would see his men storm the Spanish holdout and bring him victory. The siege dragged on, however. As months passed, new strategies had to be developed. The Inca tore apart roads and streets in order to neutralise cavalry charges. They feigned retreats down narrow alleys in order to lure horsemen into traps. Bolas, a weapon normally reserved for hunting, was introduced in order to tie up charging horses' legs. The battle for Cusco was brutal and long. Spaniards on horses charged at Inca soldiers down narrow streets, and the entire city was essentially reduced to ashes. In the city, one eyewitness wrote, the Indians waged such a fierce attack that the Spaniards thought themselves a thousand times lost. While he besieged Cuzco, Manco had sent his finest general, Quiso, to tie down Francisco Pizarro, who was currently in Lima. Quiso was an excellent tactician. He had realized that attacking cavalry on a level ground was a death sentence. Inca troops could do nothing against a charge. Instead, he would use the terrain against them, only meeting the Spanish on steep hills and mountains. There he would lure them into a tight pass, block the entrances with his troops, and rain boulders down on the horses. Quiso managed to wipe out a total of four separate Spanish relief forces using these tactics, and sent Spanish weapons and armor back to his emperor at Cuzco. Francisco Pizarro started to panic. He had just sent more than a hundred horsemen to their deaths at the hands of Quiso, and now had 100 Spaniards to defend Lima. Just months before, he had total control over the Inca. Now, Cusco was besieged, his brother Yuan dead there, an army was outside Lima hunting down Spaniards, and more than a third of his forces were dead. Hearing of Quiso's unprecedented victories, Manco ordered him to proceed to Lima and destroy the city. Not to lay siege to it like he was doing back at Cusco, but to destroy it. Lima was a Spanish city. Founded near the coast to facilitate trade, and unlike Inca cities, it was built on a flat plain. Manco's excitement at Quizo's victories had blinded him to the fact that Quizo was using tactics that could not work at Lima. Ordering him to attack Lima was a grave error. Quizo assaulted the city and failed to take it. He attacked again and again, and continued to be beaten back. But his emperor had ordered him to take it, and Quizo knew Manco needed him back at Cusco, that he needed this city and Francisco Pizarro gone, and nothing else would be sufficient. On the sixth day of the Siege of Lima, Inca troops again poured down from the hills and marched along the flat plain towards the city, with General Quizo leading the charge, lance in hand, with his hand-selected vanguard. As he entered the city, a sudden barrage of arquebuses roared and ripped through the front line. Santiago was screamed as a cavalry charge rammed through the vanguard. As the dust settled and smoke cleared, the Inca army soon saw their general lying on the ground with a Spanish lance in his heart. The greatest general the Inca had was dead, and his army soon disappeared into the mountains. Pizarro was now free to go break the siege of Cusco. 
breathless Chaski's runners arrived from across the empire. They brought unwelcome news to Manco. Kiso was dead, Pizarro was approaching, Diego de Almagro had returned from Chile, defeated but with a sizable army, and Spanish reinforcements were arriving from the north. His fortunes, only so recently extremely promising, had now taken a grim turn. He had lost, and he knew it. The ten-month-long siege of Cusco was a failure. Manco assembled his chiefs and captains, and with a solemn voice, he informed his people that he would cede his treasures, his home, his empire, and would retreat into the remote rainforest region of the empire called Vilcabamba. From there, he would try and fight another day. As Manco retreated deep into the rainforest, he brought with him the mummies of all the Sapa Incas that had ruled before him, including his father, Huayna Capac, and his great-great-grandfather, Pachacuti. From Vilcambaba, Manco waged an aggressive guerrilla-style campaign against the Spanish. His soldiers ambushed supply convoys, raided new towns, stole caches of weapons and horses, and then vanished back into the rainforest. His men learned how to ride horses, fire guns, and fashion Spanish weapons. But the population of Spaniards in Peru essentially doubled with each passing year. It became clear to Manco as he aged that survival was possible, but Tahuantinsuyu, a land of four parts together, would never be remade. His state would continue to survive in the rainforest. As Almagro died fighting a civil war against the Pizarros, as Francisco Pizarro was assassinated, while Hernando Pizarro rotted in a Spanish prison, and as Gonzalo Pizarro was executed on the orders of the king, the Inca state clung to life for decades, until eventually, in 1572, 36 years after Manco's rebellion, his son and the last Inca emperor, Tupac Amaru, was captured and executed and the empire of Pachacuti was erased. These videos are made possible by our brilliant patrons over at Patreon and our YouTube sponsors. Visit our Patreon to learn more about the perks. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.